There's so many ways to worship the Lord, isn't there? It's not just singing a song by any means. Um, but uh, we're going we're gonna to do something a little bit different. We're going to worship the Lord in a different way now. You know, the Bible says that we overcome our enemy. Do you guys know who our enemy is? Satan, the, the devil, the one who hates you. He's trying to ruin your life. Everything that comes against what God would want for you, that's the enemy trying to ruin your life. And there's two ways that we overcome this. The Bible's clear that we overcome him by the blood of the Lamb. So, of course, what Jesus did on the cross, that's number one. Without that, we got no hope, right? And the word of our testimony. The reason why we give testimony is because to those that are not believers, they hear someone's testimony of the goodness of God in in a believer's life, and it's an overwhelming, powerful uh, way to to describe and display the reality of this God that we're in here worshiping. And then for the believer, it's a, a strong testimony. It just secures your heart once again to that Savior. And so uh, it's good to hear a testimony of, of God's grace and His faithfulness in our lives. This past week was crazy, right? With Irma. You guys remember her? You didn't forget yet, did you? Yeah, it was Irma Geddon, right? Yeah. So some of us remember her real well because we still don't have electricity. Anybody still have no electricity? Only one left, huh? Don't let him fool you. He's staying in a house with a pool, okay? <laughs> His God is good. Yes, he is. <laughs> so, but um, show of hands, anybody, any evidence uh, of God's grace in their life during this storm? Anybody like this amazing thing that he, he showed himself strong, right? Okay, so, so let's do this. I'm gonna, just going to crack the seal here real quick. And then I'm going to ask you to be bold. You don't look like a bunch of wimps here. You look like you're pretty tough. Like you have some, you get some boldness in you, right? And you'll come up here and you'll share. This is what I'd like. I'm going to crack the seal, but then I'm going to ask three or four people, five people, whatever, to come up. Try to be cognizant of time. Don't go crazy. But just take a moment or two and, and maybe you can share with your church family what God did. <clears throat> so prior to the storm coming, my wife's one prayer was lord can we please have electricity you know we got the two kids and you know having no air conditioning ruining all of our food we're not like wealthy people we need we need we need power so we've lost power at our house lots of times we all have right good storm comes through we lose power but she prayed she said lord i just want electricity please let us have electricity she she told me that's what her prayer was so she prayed that lots and lots and lots so about midnight, I share this with people on Monday and Wednesday, so it's redundant for some, but new for others. She prayed about, I don't know, maybe about midnight or something. I don't even remember. The storm's just coming through, right? So like a stupid man that I am, I open up the front door because I want to watch that, right? I want to see the cats flying by, and you know, you know what I mean? So, so, sorry, cat lovers. <clears throat> Marie, I didn't say dogs, wherever she is. Love you. Um, so, so uh, I opened the door. Now at our house, if you're looking out my front door, to the left is the entrance to the subdivision. We're about 25 houses in. 20, 25, something like that. And all of a sudden, doom, 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 doom. Black, 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 black. Dark, no street lights, no lights in the house. Our next door neighbor's Ricardo. His lights went out, and boom, it stopped right there. And our lights never even flickered the entire storm. It's amazing. It's amazing. So, not to make you, not to like make light, but while you were all out there struggling, it was 71 and cozy in my house. So praise the Lord. <laughs> yeah, just stick it in. Yeah, yeah. But he was good, right? I, prayer's weird, right? Prayer's kind of mysterious. I don't even know how that worked. But I know she prayed and the electric stayed on right there right so it was awesome so we praise god for that anybody else come on come let's see a little line come up here just come on come on come on come up come up come up and share please right here
Okay, so I'm no stranger to the average miracle, as if there was ever such a thing. Um, but this one, this one was good. I was reminded on Facebook the two days before the storm that we are protected by an almighty God. We're protected by the same God that instructed the Israelites to cover their door lintels with the blood of a pure lamb. Well, I don't have a whole lot of lambs. <laughs> and it's kind of gross. Um, so I chose olive oil because olive oil was very much in use then. I went about my house, I anointed all my doorposts, I anointed all my windows, I made little crosses in the, with the oil, and I, and I prayed for that protection from the storm for my home. Um, I live in Umatilla. The tornado that wiped out so much of Umatilla went down my street, my husband watched it. Um, my whole street, if you turn onto my road off of 450, it was apocalyptic. It was horrible. Trees on houses, everything was laying around all over the place. But then you come to my house and it's just my house. There was nothing. The, the, the hurricane actually did me a favor and pulled down two trees that really needed to go anyway. <laughs> Took them down across the road, no harm to anybody or anything. And everything is back now and in some cases even better than it was before. So, praise God. First of all, this is going to be a shameless plug for anybody who doesn't come to Monday night for prayer. Um, prayer is so very freaking important. For those of you who don't know me, I fell off a roof and I'm in constant pain. My pain is so horrible. I only sleep two to three hours at a time and it wakes me up. I've been doing this for four years through the strength of God. Uh, it's not exciting and no, I don't like it. Matter of fact, I've asked him to bring me home a couple of times because I get tired, it drains me. But uh, you know me, I stay in church. I'm always somewhere and the reason I do that because I get my strength from him. And uh, Irma Gatton, Gatton had worn me down. We had no uh, power. Uh, the heat, I couldn't sleep any time during the day or the night. Uh, I wasn't eating well. And then there's a thing that I do is I do uh, cardio and my, my physical therapy at the YMCA or Planet Fitness. They're both closed. Uh, four days, it drained me. You know, I, and I, I do ministry too, so I pour out to people. And then on top of that, I had scheduled a group to come over to River Rest um, Retirement Community to uh, fix the uh, awnings, on, I mean, the, uh, uh, the, top, the pieces on my outside of my roof. I said, I just need a few people. And uh, they come knocking, about 30 people. Uh, they fixed my, my trailer, my neighbor's trailer, cleaned the whole street. Uh, but here's the story. One of the volunteers, the reason I moved to that retirement community is not for those houses or, or anything else because I liked it. I had come down here a couple years ago and there's a bench that sits by the canal. And I pray at that bench. Uh, it's anointed. When I'm sitting there praying, I can almost feel God sitting right next to me. Well, I shared this with a young lady. I'm going to show you how powerful the presence of God is. I, we were walking back there and I was telling her the story. And we got back to the bench. And these big old goosebumps jumped out of her all over the place. She said she could feel God. Uh, I'm telling you, prayer is so freaking important. Uh, it's everything. Uh, I'm in prayer constantly all day. And I had been crying to my father that morning. And I said, God, I can't take this no more. I can't do it. I can't do it. I went to a service Friday night. 
and somebody had been they, they didn't have power either but they had a hotel and they had rented it to the whole week and they said we got power back and you could have the hotel well I didn't get to the hotel because somebody called me right after they left and says I know a snowbird and they won't be back till November and they have a three bedroom house you and your son can stay in with a pool uh, it was so annoying that I uh, told you I only sleep two to three hours at a time. The first night there, I slept four hours. <laughs> My God, our God is so good. Um, I'm telling you, get into a prayer regime. He wants to hear from you. Um, I can't ex expound how much prayer, how important it is. Um, Y'all need to get here on Monday nights. After that, I don't know what to say. <laughs> you pretty much topped it all off right there. Um, during Hurricane Irma, we decided to stay at our residence. Um, our landlord Dolores brought us into her house many years ago when we were looking for a home. Well, at her house, she has two acorn trees that have been there for about 100 years old, and the house is 55 years old. So you can probably think, okay, Irma is probably going to blow these trees, they're all going to knock down, and we're just not going to have a house. <sighs> we still have the house. Those, those trees did not move an inch only the little tiny branches just fell off and sure we had a few acorns hit our roofs but no damage whatsoever just only one tiny little screen little scratch but that's it so that reminded me that God is our foundation he is our trunk we are the branches and we are the ones that have to reach out so be firm let him be your firm amen anybody else doesn't get any better than this nothing we're going to do is going to top it so you got anybody anybody else anyone no all right well let's let's pray and then we're going to we're going to worship him in a different way we're going to sing we're going to sing to him and and I and you'll love the song that we're gonna sing. It's gonna be so apropos. But but uh, let's just sing to him. Like let's just tell him in this song, by the way you sing, with the passion that you're singing with. Let's just express express to him our gratitude for what he has done for us over this last week in saving us and protecting us and providing for us with a a three two with a pool. Come on, right. <laughs> So, Father, we are so grateful for who you are. We are grateful that uh, we are who we are. We get to be in your family. We are sons and daughters. How awesome is that, Lord? And so, Lord, we, we just want to sing to you. We, you're worthy of that. You're worthy of our highest praise. You're worthy of, 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 our, of our resources, our energy right now. The breath in our lungs is yours, and we want to use it right now to sing to you and let our praise be a thank you for who you are and your provision and your protection over us during the storm. Thank you for reminding us that, that although Irma was strong, that the name Irma does not go above the name of Jesus, that Jesus is the name above all names. And that's the name that we're going to praise right now, church. Receive our sacrifice of praise now. In Jesus' name, amen. Why don't we come to our feet, church? Right. I don't know if anybody hasn't made up their mind yet um, on who Jesus is, but uh, if you haven't, I believe that tonight's going to help. And if you have, then I think tonight will solidify that even more. So uh, why don't we go ahead and grab a copy of God's Word and uh, just get it in your hand. I'll, I'll tell you where we're going to be in just a little bit, but please uh, get a copy of it into your hand as soon as possible. 
That's what we do here. Um, as you're grabbing that, I just want to say that there's a, there's a, there's a, um, there's a lot of places that a message comes from. And I, what I mean by that, I don't mean by like, uh, you know, I get the content from a message uh, from People Magazine or, 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 or someone's opinion, like my opinion doesn't really matter and your opinion really doesn't matter and, and, and you know, some good book or, or something like that. Like that's not where we get uh, the content for a, for a vertical message. Where would we get the content for something like that? What's that? Someone, someone have a voice. In the Bible, in the Bible, and from God's Word. So we want to get the content for, the, for a message uh, from God, from God's Word. Uh, but what I mean by the, 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 um, where the sermon comes from is I'm talking about maybe like inspiration as to where the sermon comes from. And what I mean by that is, um, like so sometimes I'm reading the Bible and uh, you know, one day it's alive, this section. The next day I don't get anything from it. Anyone ever been there, right? So it's kind of a, an, an awkward thing. It just kind of shows that it's alive and, and hopefully you are too. Um, but it kind of changes sometimes. Um, but uh, this sermon, uh, the inspiration for this sermon, um, I thought was going to come from uh, Luke 18 because the last two weeks we've been in Luke 17. And so what do we do here at our church is we go through the scriptures to find out what God has to say for us. So, so I, I go to Luke 18 and I'm reading it diligently over and over again. And it's good. It'll, it'll preach, right? But, but, but what happened was early in the week I was doing what I often do. And that is I'm listening and watching sermons from, from trusted men of God, uh, guys who are, are dedicated uh, preachers, guys who are, are, are well-versed in the scriptures, known, trusted men of God, leading tremendously powerful, impactful ministries worldwide. And I watch these things. And, and because I need to be fed too, right? You come here, well, I got to go somewhere. And so I, I go and I watch these certain guys. I'm very selective on who I'm watching. I don't just watch anybody, right? 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 We don't just watch anybody. That could be dangerous. Don't just, just look stuff up on Google and hope for the best. That's dumb. And, and so I watch these guys. And so as I'm watching, I watch probably four, five, six messages a week from various guys. And so I can't even tell you the specific... Uh, message that this guy was given. But during his message, he was reading a section of scripture, and as he was reading it, one word popped out, and it jumped out of my phone, like wham, right? It hit me. And, and, it, and, it, and it began my, I, like, I was like, oh, whoa, like it, it just, it clobbered me. One word, one word. And, and so began my seek and, and discover mission. I had to get more of this. I need to learn. I need to know. I want to discover this, what God has for me, and I want to pass it on to you. That's what I want to do here tonight. That's where the inspiration for the message came from. One word from Luke chapter 5. Please go there. We're backpedaling a little bit, but um, God's word is all good, right? Say it's all good. It's all good. You got to say it right, right? You can't just say it's all good. You got to go, it's all good. It's all good, right, right. It's all good. And so Luke chapter 5, we're going to read, we're going to start reading in verse 17, and we're going to read through 26, and um, I'm going to give you a second to, to get there, and then I'm going to do something that I neglected to do last week, but I really wanted to, and I'm not going to neglect it this week. Um, when you're there, I'd like for you to stand as we read God's word, not to honor the messenger in any way, but to honor the message and the person who authored this, God Almighty. So you're standing in reverence to him, just a sign from him that you care, that you're listening, that you're paying attention, right? Yeah. All right, we all there? Awesome. All right, here we go. This is um, Luke chapter 5, and uh, starting in verse 17, I want you to try to tell me if you can find the one word, see if you can hear it. You ready? One day while Jesus was teaching, some Pharisees and teachers of religious law were sitting nearby. My Bible has parentheses there, and it says, it seemed that these men showed up from every village in all Galilee and Judea, as well as from Jerusalem. I love that. Uh, 
I know not in this church, but a lot of times in churches, uh, the annoying people show up, right? The ones who always have a, a gripe and a complaint, and they're not here to learn anything. They just want to complain about your church, right? I know you guys would never do that, but they do, they do show up. Uh, they usually leave as quick as they came. Um, so anyway, he's there, and it says that the Lord's healing power was strongly with Jesus. Now, some men came carrying a paralyzed man on a sleeping mat, they tried to take him inside to Jesus, but they couldn't reach him because of the crowd. Isn't that awesome? Wouldn't that be, don't you want that for your church, right? That, that so many of us were like the lady who, who were at the well, that they were so overwhelmed by Jesus, but they, and they brought all their friends and family to come see this guy. That was for you. Place, just imagine that this place would be packed. So many people wanted to hear from the Lord. It would be awesome. So they went up to the roof and took off some tiles. If that was Lake County, you'd hear, you'd hear the scratching of the roof and the removal of the tiles. Then you'd hear, ch -ch, right? <laughs> As they, don't come in my house. We're Republican. <laughs> <laughs> so they removed the tiles. Then they lowered the sick man on his mat down into the crowd right in front of Jesus. Seeing <clears throat> their faith. Hint, hint. <laughs> remember, the, remember, the, remember, the, remember the movie The Sting, Old People? You remember that? That's the signal. Seeing <clears throat> their faith. Jesus said to the man, Young man, your sins are forgiven. But the Pharisees and teachers of religious law said to themselves, Who does he think he is? That's blasphemy. Only God can forgive sins. The Pharisees were so off, so often. But this time, because they were experts in the rules, they knew who Jesus really was, but they wouldn't say it. They knew there was only one who could forgive sin. Yeah. Right. And he should have just said, you're right. <laughs> but the Pharisees and teachers of religious law said to themselves, who does he think he is? That's blasphemy. Only God can forgive sins. Duh. Jesus knew what they were thinking. You know, what, you know what it says in, I think, Matthew? Jesus could see what they were thinking. <laughs> what if he saw what you were thinking right now? He can. He is. Jesus could see what they were thinking, so he asked them, why do you question this in your hearts? Is it easier to say your sins are forgiven or stand up and walk? I think the greater thing is the sins are forgiven, but it's easy to say sins are forgiven because there's no proof of it, right? That's what Jesus is saying. There's no proof. You say they're forgiven, but there's no proof until the time comes that heaven or hell is there, and we've got to make it, we gotta figure out where we're going, so that's, that's when that's going to prove itself. But how hard would it be to say stand up and walk? Well, if he's wrong, that's going to ruin all of his credibility right then and there, right? Awesome. So Jesus is not afraid of that in any way. doesn't shy away from it. He says, uh, so I'll prove to you that the Son of Man, that's what he called himself, has the authority on earth to forgive sins. Then Jesus turned to the paralyzed man and said, stand up, pick up your mat, and go home. Like clear, right? Not beating around the bush in any way. <laughs> Boom, right, drop the mic. And immediately as everyone watched, the man jumped up. See, he didn't just stand up. He didn't just give this guy a hotel. He gave him a 3-2 with a pool. <laughs> Thank you, Ricky. And immediately as everyone watched, the man jumped up and jumped in his pool. No. He picked up his mat, though, and he went home praising God. I know, I know Ricky did that. Everyone was gripped with great wonder and awe. We need some more awe in the church. We need some awe. Like not baby awe. Not like baby cute awe. Like <gasps> awe that inhales, not exhales. <gasps> like that. Everyone was gripped with great wonder and awe and they praised God, exclaiming, we have seen amazing things today. That's like one of the greatest understatements in all of, of, in all of Scripture. We've seen amazing things here today. Really? <laughs> awesome. So, so 
Did you see the word? Oh, I just gave you a hint. Let's see how smart you guys are. What was it? C. All right, you guys can sit down. Um, I'm going to expand it to three words, though, just for, for our evening together. Seeing their faith, right? Seeing their faith. See, Jesus is looking for something, isn't he? What's he looking for? He's looking for faith. You know, the Bible says the eyes of the Lord go back and forth across the earth, seeking, seeing, looking for the heart that's completely his, so he can strengthen it even more. If you're his, and you're going after him, he's going to give you more. He's going to strengthen you more. He's looking right now, we said it, right this second, Jesus Christ The second person of the Trinity, the creator of heaven and earth, is looking at you, and he wants to see some faith. That's what he wants to see. In the scriptures, it says that he's the one who gives you the faith. So what he wants us to do is to be a good steward of what he's given us. Are you using the faith that I gave you? That's what he's looking for. What does that mean, faith? Okay, so let's, let, we got to get a definition up, right? We want to get a definition up. And, it, and if you search the scriptures in their entirety, it says a lot about faith. There's faith all in the Bible, all over the place. And, and so taking all, all of the scriptures into account, I've done everything that I possibly can to melt it down as simple and as easy as I can so you can understand it you can embrace it. You can share it with people. right? You can, this is something you can use. Faith is simply this. It is belief lived out. Right? It's, faith, it's belief lived out. If you want to, you could say it's uh, belief in action. So, so the question is, is Does your life reflect what you say you believe? Are you living by faith? So I'm going to title this message, Faith or Fake? Faith or Fake? Now listen, I was going to, I had a lot of different titles going in my head, you know, Uh, coming into the weekend, I was going to call this, I was going to call that. One of the ones that really jumped out first was, quit telling me about your faith. That's not going to work though. The reason why is because if I say it like that, you can hear the inflection in my voice. You can understand what I'm telling you. Like, don't just tell me about your faith. You can hear that in my voice when I said, quit telling me about your faith. You can hear that in the way I say it. But if I text it or I put it on YouTube with a title, they're going to be like, wait a minute, I thought we were supposed to tell people about Jesus. Well, many, many times from this pulpit, and I'll keep doing it, I'm going to tell you that at some point, this lifestyle evangelism that's crept into the church as the main thing, like that's good and everything, but at some point, you have to open your mouth and tell people about Jesus. The Bible says, how will they know unless they are told, right? You have to say something. So I can't title it, quit telling me about your faith, because that would kind of go against everything that we've said. So we're just going to call it fake, I'm sorry, faith or fake. So, so here's the thing that's really weird. I abandoned Luke 18 and I went to Luke 5. And so I started discovering and searching and the Bible says to, to, to study, to show yourself approved, rightly dividing the word of truth. And so I'm digging in and I'm looking stuff up and all of a sudden, I started thinking about Luke 18. And I'm like, wait a minute. Hold on a second. Let me go back there. Let me go back there. Hold on something. And I started thinking about it. And I, it dawned on me. I'm like, wait a minute. Luke 18 is the same thing. Luke 18 is the same thing. Look, God's word is so perfectly timed and spaced and, and laid out. And, and we got done with 17, and we're going to 18, and I, I, I hear this thing about seeing faith, and, and I'm like, oh, I'm going to abandon 18. I don't need to abandon 18. Let me tell you a little bit about Luke 18. 
Luke 18 is the story of, the heading is the persistent widow. You can call it whatever you want. That's not God-given name of the section. It's just what people call it to identify it. It's this. It's this woman who goes up to this judge who doesn't give a rip about God, doesn't care about people, has no moral standards, and she's asking him to do something for her. And he's like, whatever. But she continues to harp on him and harp on him, and she won't go away. She's annoying like crazy. She keeps knocking, 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 asking, asking, asking. And finally, he gives in and gives her what she wants. And, and Jesus says, how much more would God do that? God's not, God's not rude, and, and God doesn't hate you. And this guy didn't like anyone. He didn't care about God. He didn't care about God's standards, didn't care about you, doesn't care about people, nothing. And he gave in. How about God who loves you and wants to give? How much more would he give to that person if they would continue to come after him? and pray, and ask, and believe, and have faith, and know who God is, and know that he promises to provide, and know that he wants to give, and so I'm going to continue to come after him. And so at the very end of that story, Jesus says something, the last sentence. He says, but when the Son of Man, him, returns, you know he's coming back, right? Okay, that was weak. You know he's coming back, right? Anybody excited about that? I'm super excited about that. Listen, when he comes back, how many will he find? Doesn't that imply sight again? He's, gonna, he's looking for something, right? How many will he find on the earth who have faith? Again, he's going to come back, and he's going to be looking for something. What's he looking for? Again, he's looking for faith. He's looking for faith. He's always looking for something. See, it's one thing to hear the message of Jesus, hear the gospel, and just go, well, I believe that. Well, that's actually kind of worthless. You know, the Bible says that even the demons believe that. Like, it's undeniable. Anyone with even a, a, a decent brain, like not even the smart, like, because I'm not the smart one. I barely graduated high school. Anybody with me? No, you're all a bunch of brainiac Harvard people, right? <clears throat> Anyone with a brain that functions at all, if you read through just Luke, you gotta know there's a God. Like, wow, right? You walk outside and you just see the, the natural beauty, you just know. You might not call him Jesus, but you know there's a God. Yeah. You do. I mean, there's just, under, no, anyone, I'm just gonna say it right now, on Facebook, it's live, I'm telling you, if you don't believe in God, you are stupid. <laughs> There's no way this is a chemical kind of supernatural, stupid little uh, random bumping into each other thing that made my wife and my kids. So sorry for your luck. So, <clears throat> so, so, and then they love me on top of it. That can't be chemical. That's got to be something divine. <laughs> and, and so, although this, no, never mind. Okay, so. So, so, so it's okay to, to say, like, oh, I just believe. But it's one thing to, to say, to hear the message and to say, oh, I believe that. But, like, over in Hebrews chapter 4, it talks about people that heard the good news, heard about God. They, they believed it, but they didn't do anything about it. But then the ones that it actually impacted, you know, the, one, the, the gospel helps some and the gospel helps, doesn't help others. Let's, let's just see what it is, right? I mean, I, I share the gospel with many. And sometimes it really changes their life, and sometimes it just does nothing. Right? In Hebrews chapter 4, verse 2, it says that the ones who found it useful, they took what they heard and they combined it with faith. See, those people, it changes their life. See, real belief, it, it should drive your actions, it should impact your will. It's not just something you believe here. It should change the way you act. It should change your perspective. It should change your life. That's real belief. Further on in Hebrews where it defines faith in a longer sentence than I did, it's better than mine. It's the Bible. Amen? Amen. Hebrews chapter 11 verse 1 says that faith shows. Isn't that seeing again? Yeah. Isn't it show? Um, it says it shows the reality of what we hope for. See, what we hope for is what we believe. We believe that there's a God, 
And, and we believe that we're sinners because we believe the Bible. So we believe there's a God, we believe there's a sinner, and, and we believe that Jesus came to pay the price for our sins so we could be promised everlasting life and that he's gone away to prepare heaven for us and he's gonna come back on that day. He's gonna rip open the clouds, gather us up, and take us to where he is forever. That's what we believe, that's what we hope for, right? And faith shows in the life, if you believe what I just said for real, your life will show it. You'll live in a way that displays you really believe that. It's not just a verse in Scripture. Jesus' half-brother, James, would say it, also reiterate the same thing in his book. Uh, James chapter 2, 19 and 20 would say that belief without action is useless. See, what happens is a lot of times people confuse sincerity with faith. They, they, they honestly, like, they hear the gospel, they hear God's word proclaimed to them, they say they believe it, they have good intentions, like, I, I believe that, but that's not faith. The demons believe it. They are sincerely believers. They believe that there's a God, and they stand in opposition to him because they know that he's real. If he wasn't real, what would they be standing against? Nothing, Right? It's kind of like the atheist who fights and fights and fights about God. Why are you fighting against something that doesn't exist? Right? Seems stupid, right? Oh, because he, oh, he does. Further stupid. <clears throat> like, why waste your time, right? Why waste your time fighting against something that doesn't exist? Go play football or something. Wasting your breath. Don't confuse sincerity for faith. See, what God commands and what God promises and who God is, this is what we believe. And if what we believe, if this is what we believe, then it must permeate my will. So my actions would prove that my belief is authentic. It's not just enough to, to say I believe. Like, that's what I meant by, don't just tell me you believe. Don't, don't tell me about your faith. Quit telling me about your faith. Let me see it. Let me see it, right? You know, the scary thing is, 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 is I'm not making any of this up, right? Like Jesus says that on that day, like there's a day that's coming, right? Do you guys understand there's a day that's coming? Like, and Christians, we, 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 within Christianity, we fight about the day. We fight about everything. We fight about the day, when it's coming, how it's going to happen, before this or after this or in the middle of this or whatever. Like, who cares when it's coming? Let's just agree with Jesus Christ that there's a day, yeah. right? There's a day you're either going to heaven or you're going to hell. I mean, there's a day. I don't know if it's going to be tomorrow or, or next Tuesday, but there's a day on the horizon, and it's coming, and on that day, we're going to one or two places, and Jesus said that on that day, there'll be some, many, that thought that they were Christians, but they were not. Right. And they'll say, Lord, Lord, and he'll go, who, who, who? He's probably going to ask the people, I don't know, if he'll ask the people that are in, they're going to, he's going to go, who, who are these guys? Who's him? Who's that guy? I know, he's going to say, I, I never even knew you. There's a day that's coming where so, a lot of people are going to be disappointed because they may have said they believed it, but their faith showed otherwise. Jesus wants to see your faith. One of the tragic things that could come out of today is that we could leave here um, and you'd walk out and go, you know what, I, I just don't have enough faith. Preacher said I didn't have enough faith. And that could be dangerous. And, and so let, let's just say this. None of us have enough faith. You should desire more, right? Right? But I think we need to be specific because if there's areas that are specific where your fa faith is lacking, then there's something you can, you can, don't just walk out of here clueless and go, I don't have enough faith. I need more faith. That's kind of a blanket statement. And you can get lost in that shuffle. But if you have some specifics, you can say, okay, Lord, in this area, on this specific thing, I need faith. I need you to bolster my faith in this because I'm lacking. 
help me, Lord, right? I think he'd meet you there. Would you, do you agree that he'd meet you there? Yeah. I agree that he would meet you there if you would specifically ask him for these things. So let's, I, I've got just three things I want to go over tonight. Um, let, the first one we, we covered last week big time. I, 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 could, I, I could see the dagger going in. I, I, I think it was, I think, uh, I think it was, maybe it was Jay said he walked out with bloody toes or something. I don't know what it was. But, but it was this, this topic of, of forgiveness. Right? We all need help in that, including me. Uh, how about, you know, you know what I'm talking about? Last week I, I talked to you about, I think there was about four people here because of the storm, but for those four people, you were highly impacted, right? Yeah, highly impacted. Um, but, 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 hey, listen, if, if someone comes to you and they sin against you and they ask for forgiveness, uh, even if it's not genuine, it doesn't say anything in there about you need to s use your discerner to see if it was a genuine uh, repentance and, and, and asking of a forgiveness. It doesn't say that. It says if they se sin against you seven times a day and each time they just say, hey, I'm sorry, will you forgive me? What's it say you got to do? Yeah. Right? You must. You must. You must forgive. So we're just going to kind of expand on that because that wasn't hard enough. So let, let's just, um, let's do this. Let's look over in uh, Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4. Uh, verse 32. So here, here, here's Paul. He's going to talk about forgiveness some more. Uh, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, so it's really God speaking here to us, instructing us on how to live. There's a way he wants us to live. Um, we believe in God, then that means we're supposed to do what he says, right? Amen? Okay, so, so prior to this uh, verse 32, Paul is saying that there's, there's ways that, that the, that the non-believer lives, right? And, and, and God doesn't want you to live that way anymore, so he lists a bunch of different kinds of, of behaviors, you know, bitterness, rage, anger, harsh words, slander, all that stuff, all types of evil behavior, he says, kind of blankets it all in. Uh, but he says, instead of those ways, uh, be kind to each other. Are you kind? Are you, are you kind to one another? Um, Tender-hearted. What does that mean? What's tender-hearted mean? Tender, like a soft heart, like so you're so. And I need help with this. I'm from Boston. I need help. That I, I, my heart, my heart is hard sometimes, and I think it's getting better. But it's hard sometimes when someone wrongs me. It it hits my the wall of my heart like this, and I want to fight back. Like that's just right. But this is like no, don't 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 be that way, right? So I think we could ask the Lord and he would help us with that, right? Yeah. He wouldn't put it in his word if he didn't want you to have it, right? Okay, so be tenderhearted. Now here we are, here we are. Forgiving one another just as God through Christ has forgiven you. We're gonna refer back to that. Now, now just jump forward, uh, you know, after Ephesians is Philippians, then Colossians. Colossians chapter three. Colossians chapter three. Verse 13. It says, um, make allowance for each other's faults. I mean, that's kind of awesome because what that's telling, telling us as believers is that um, people are going to have faults. They're going to fail you. They're going to offend you. They're going to sin against you. Make an allowance for that. Like, in other words, uh, Mike... I know you're going to sin against me, so here, what I'm going to do is I'm going to give you an allowance. I'm going to give you three free sins. That's what an allowance is. I'm telling you that I'm giving you permission that if you, if you sin, which I hope that you won't, but if you do, I won't come after you in, 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 in likeness. I won't do that. I'll be tenderhearted. I'll make an allowance for your sins, right? That would be a, preempt, a preemptive attack. How about that, if we all had that attitude, if we, if we all gave each other, just in this church alone, you know how many people leave churches because they get offended? Uh, half of you'd have, and now you're here. So before you leave here, right, seriously, before you leave here, why don't we try to do this? Why don't we right now decide in our mind as a, as a matter of our will to give each other three free sins? How about that right now? Can we do that? Let's do that. Would you do, raise your hand if you're gonna do that. 
don't make a vow lightly, right? Don't make a vow lightly. But give each other three free sins. Because, because if you know it's coming, right? And God's word says to make an allowance for each other's faults. Okay, here we go. Now, <laughs> what that means is when they do fall to you, he says, and forgive anyone who offends you. Remember the Lord forgave you so you, what? M what? Must. must. Is there any room for negotiation in there? Okay. So you must forgive others. You know what I love this? It says right here, forgive anyone who offends you and you must do it. That's crazy. You're asking me to do something really hard here, God. Yeah. Jesus on the cross kind of brings your difficult task down a notch or two, doesn't it? Yes. Right? So, so we're supposed to be Christ-like. That's what he did. So he says, you have to forgive everyone. You must forgive just like Jesus did. And, and in that first verse that we read in Ephesians, what does it say? It says, you must forgive just as Jesus forgave your sins. So it's not just a matter of forgiving. No, 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 listen. Because a lot of us are good at saying we're forgiving, but we don't act like we're forgiving because we say we forgive and the moment there's any tension, we rehash the old sin. That's not forgiveness. The Bible says that when you accept Jesus by faith, that his sacrifice on the cross takes you and it takes your sin and it separates the two as far as the east is from the west. Can anyone tell me how far away the eastern side of the universe is from here? Could you tell me? Far. <laughs> very, very far, right? Uh, way out there, right? And can somebody tell me, this is, is going to be so easy because you already know this one. How, many, how far away is the western side of the universe from here? Really far, right? So, so, so how, far, how far away are you from the sin that you committed in God's eyes? Really far. Infinitely far away. So if that's the way that Christ forgave you, you must forgive each other just that way. Right, So Jesus, when you misbehave again over here today, he's not going, hold on a second, and getting on like some a chariot of fire and going down to the eastern side of his universe, picking up your old sin and going, Whoa, hold on a second here. Remember when you did this? Is he doing that? No. So why do you? <laughs> Belief is he forgave my sin. Anybody in here believe that he forgave their sins? That's good. That's the reason to celebrate. Yes. Belief is he forgave my sins. Faith is I'll believe it enough that I'll forgive others. Right? That's faith. <clears throat> I, I put a list down here on my, on my notes um, of three faith walls. Things that diminish faith rather than increase it and bolster it. Um, how about this? My reputation. Oh, you got to stick out your chest when you do that, though. My reputation's at stake. My reputation's at stake, right? You see, if I, if I forgive sin, if, I, if someone does this to me, and especially in our world today, like we live in a world that's this big, right? Like I can talk to someone in China Right now. I can, I can Facebook message them right now. They can write me right back. There's no distance anymore. So everything you do is under a microscope. There used to be a day where you could get away with some stuff. You can't get away with anything anymore. Certainly your sins will find you out. But, 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 but listen, if, if someone sins against, someone wrongs you, right? Well, if I, if I forgive them, then, then people are going to think I'm a softy. And it's not just men, it's women too. Like, I, that I'm a soft, that somehow, you know, I can be walked on if I let them do this. And, and, and that's not manly. If you're a guy, it's, 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 it's a sign of weakness if we forgive. It's weakness. My dad told me not to. Yeah, they get me, I'm going to get them and you do that to me. I'll get you. And, and you know the other thing you can do? is if you forgive sin, sometimes people's perception is, well, that you don't even care. 
That somehow people do this to you and you don't even care enough about it. It's almost like you're ignoring them. Well, that's not the case at all. That's just perception. But that's a, that's a wall that diminishes faith, that, that gets in the way of forgiving because we have these internal things. And um, Here's the second thing I jotted down. Uh, if I forgive, I'm setting myself up for hurt again. If I let my guard down, uh, I'm going to get hurt again. Uh, yes. Yes, you will. Um, but, really, um, offenses only offend when you hold on to them. Right? That, 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 listen, it, we, <laughs> this is what we need. I, we need a default. We need a, a change in our default. When someone sins against you, if your default is to hold on to that offense and, 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 and internalize it and then let it blow up and retaliate, that's a bad default, but that's normal, isn't it? We need a change in our default. When your default changes to, to, from that to forgiveness, uh, right? Then offenses come in, they automatically like, a, like the water off a duck's back, right? If they come in and they don't, and I don't hold on to them, then they got no place to go here, so they go immediately. Like when that's your default, you won't get hurt anymore. Are people going to sin against you? Are they going to offend you? Are they going to hurt you? Absolutely. I'm going to be one of them. But if you set your default to forgiveness rather than holding on to the offense, you won't get hurt again. Am I, am I, am I preaching to anybody here? Because I see a lot of down and out faces. They don't look like you're engaging. This is a big thing. I, I'm gifted in this way. I'm just going to tell you right now, I'm not, pro, I'm not prideful, I'm not boasting. I am gifted in this way. I can compartmentalize my life. Like, th like if you do something to me, I can shut it off. And I don't, I, you could treat me like crap for a ton of time. And I'll just let it go right off me. And I don't care, dude. You ain't getting to me. i tell you that right now. You cannot, get, listen, I sold cars for 11 years. There is nothing you can do to offend me. I make the decisions for my life. By God's grace, I am empowered to say no to any accusation, any offense, any sin. If you want to sin against me, go for it, yo. I don't care. It's not going to get to me. I made that decision of my will that I have a new default. So my reputation might be at stake. That can block faith. I might get hurt again. That can block faith. Listen, we got to change our default. We got to. Here's the third thing, cultural expectation. You know, I was talking a moment ago about, about having a small world and, and how things happen in your life. And, you know, in the days of Instagram and Snapchat and, 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 and Facebook and all that, listen, someone does something, everyone knows about it, right? And, and, and if I, listen, if I have seen it once, I've seen it a, a hundred times, that, that someone does something to someone and all the people who are sincere right? They, they love the person who got sinned against. They love the person who's been offended. And so what do they do? They round the wagons around that person, right? And they come like a pack of wolves, like a bunch of watchdogs. <laughs> Don't come near my guy. Don't come near my girl, right? And they start, they start shredding the person who has sinned, shredding them to death. No better than the original sin. Listen, their, their intentions are good, remember? I, I, I said, don't confuse sincerity with faith. Are they sincere? Well, of course. They love the person who's been sinned against. So they come to, they round the wagons up and they come to their, to their protection and they're telling you, listen, they, oh, 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 he did that to you? Oh, you, oh, let's get him. And they start, right, you see it, and all of a sudden the strand on Facebook goes, boom, of what you should do to get him back. What you should do to retaliate. Oh, oh, you deserve better than that. You should do this and you should do that. Listen, the Bible says in Psalm 1-1, King James, it says, blessed is the man who does not take counsel from the ungodly. We need to stop taking advice from people who don't have your same, if they don't have your savior, then they have no way that they should speak into your life. Amen. Never. Just go, yeah, thanks, Bye. Thanks, bye. They have no, no place 
to speak into your life if they're not living or at least trying to live this way. Right? They don't have your same mind. They don't have your same heart. They don't have your same savior. And they most likely don't have your same future. So don't take advice from See, cultural expectation says, we don't, you shouldn't forgive them. Cream them. Hurt them. Retaliate. That's what they did to you. This is what we'll do to them. Forgiveness is a massive show of faith. Do you believe that God forgave you of your sins? Then you must forgive others of theirs. Don't just believe in God. Do as he says. Amen? Amen. Here's the second one, provision. Um, I would welcome you to, to uh, join me in Matthew chapter 6. Matthew chapter 6. I got more and more excited as the week went on to come and share this with you. And I believe that, that lives in this room right now are being changed. I believe, I believe in that because I believe in the power of God's word. And I believe that there's people in this room, because I know some, most of you pretty well, that I believe your heart's desire is to actually listen to it. And although it's tough, your endeavor is to do this. And I'm seeing it happen in this church. And it brings me great joy, not to mention what it's doing for God's heart right now. Um, and so here in Matthew chapter 6, I just want to, it's kind of an extended section of scripture, so just kind of listen up. Matthew chapter 6, verse uh, 25 through the end of the, uh, 33, that's where we'll go, 25 to 33. Jesus, this is all in red, this is Jesus Christ speaking, and he's talking about provision. How many of us are, are concerned at very least about, you know, our bills and, and our food and our clothing and our expenses and all. I mean, let's just be honest in church. Show your hand if you're at least concerned about that kind of stuff, right? Isn't that why we work all the time? Right? I get it. Okay. So let, let's let the second person of the Trinity speak into that concern for you. Okay? This is what it says. That is why I, Jesus Christ, tell you not to worry about everyday life. Whether you have enough food and drink or enough clothing to wear. Isn't life more than food and your body more than clothing? Look at the birds. They don't plant or harvest or store food in barns for your heavenly father feeds them. Just think about that for just a second. Every day, all day, every day for a, an animal's entire life, he just provides for them. They don't worry about it. They just go out, oh, I'm hungry. There's a berry. What a coincidence. And they eat it, right? It's awesome. Oh, I'm hungry. There's a worm. I eat it. Oh, I'm hungry. There's a fish. I eat it. That's just the way it works, right? That's what he does. And aren't you far more valuable to him than they are? Can all your worries add a single moment to your life? So that's a, a rhetorical question, but, but what, what's the answer to that? No, can it? Can all your worries add one second to your life? No. Yeah, stress kills. Okay, so listen. So if you know that, not just because he's teaching you that, but you've lived it, why worry about your clothing? Why worry about that expense? Look at the lilies of the field and how they grow. They don't work or make their clothing, yet Solomon in all his glory was not dressed as beautiful as they are. And if God cares so wonderfully for wildflowers that are here today and thrown into the fire tomorrow, he will certainly care for you. Why do you have so little faith? Now he's getting close to home here, right? He's saying that if you believe who I am, you won't be worried about these things. That's what he's saying. I'm watching you and I'm seeing a lack of trust in me. And so if we're, we, the reason why I use concerned is because that's what Christians do to disguise their worry. That's what I say too. Because let's just be honest here. I worry about finances, and you do too. But, we, but we're Christians, so we don't want to say worry because then we're indicted. And you'll all look at each other going, oh, you worry about finances? Well, I don't. So we say, no, I'm just concerned. You're worried. <laughs> right? I'll take that laughter as a yes. 
So what does it say? So don't worry about these things, saying, what will I eat? What will we drink? What will we wear? That's just a, a, a way of saying, like, my stuff, my, my provision, right? Watch this. This is, this is to the guts. These things dominate the thoughts of unbelievers. People who don't have the creator of heaven and earth who's ready and willing and able to provide for your needs, like those people, if they don't have that, yeah, that's what they think about. But we're believers. We have him, right? We have him. And so he says, see, your father, your heavenly father already knows all your needs. Seek the kingdom of God above all else and live righteously. What does that mean? Living righteously. Let's just say, live this way. Can we, just, can we just melt it down to that? Live this way, right? Okay. So seek the kingdom above all else and live this way, and he will give you everything you need. Isn't that awesome too? Don't we feel like we have to earn everything? And we kind of do in our, in our world. We got to earn something. You got to earn respect. You got to earn a living. You got to earn position. You got to earn a degree. You got to earn a spot on the team. You got to earn, 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 earn. And God, the creator of heaven and earth, who has all the un unlimited glorious riches of heaven, says, I'll just give you everything you need. Isn't that awesome? That's incredible, right? So, so, I will give you everything. So seek the kingdom of God above all else and live righteously and I'll give you everything that I already know you need. I'll give it to you. So do, does my life reflect that I actually believe this? You've got to ask this question of yourself. Does my life actually reflect that I believe this? Does, do, do my actions reflect dependence? Does my schedule reflect trust? So, so here's my, here's my, okay, God, I'm coming to the altar. Here's my calendar. Here's my wallet. Here's my attention. Here's every resource that I have at my disposal. And I'm not just meaning resource as in cash. I mean every resource, things that I have that I'm going to give up. Like you only have a certain amount of time that you've been given in a day. We have 24 hours in a day, right? That's a resource that's at your disposal. What, okay, so Lord, here's, here's my calendar, my time. Here's my focus, my attention, my everything. And I just want to lay it all on the table. And I want to take this verse of seeking the kingdom of God above all else and lay it over all that stuff. And, and see if I'm actually living a life that reflects that I really believe this. Because we read it. You just read it with me. Do you really believe it is one thing. Will you live it? That's faith, right? Belief lived out. So he says, seek first the kingdom of God. What's that mean? Well, it happens in two places. It's in here. Right? He wants to grow the kingdom of God in you. He wants you to become more like Christ, right? He wants to grow it inwardly. You know, the Bible says in 1 Timothy 2, 4, that it is God's desire that all are saved and come to an understanding of the truth, right? But it also says in 1 Thessalonians 4, 3, that it is God's will that all of you who are saved would become sanctified, would be changed. So he doesn't just want to save you. At that point, now he wants to change you. What does he want to change you into? Romans 8, 29, we say it all the time. Into the image of Christ. Less of me, more of him. That's his goal in our life, right? So, so let me ask you a question. Are you pursuing that above all else? In the context of calendar, cash, focus, every resource. He said, seek my kingdom above everything else. Are you doing that? Because if, if you are doing that, it's because you actually believe that God's word is true, that he already knows your needs. And if you do pursue that, number one, that he will provide all that you need. If you're not doing that, I didn't write this, that means you do not believe it really. It's honest. It's what it says. So he wants to grow us inside, seeking the kingdom in me. I want to grow, Lord. I want to change. I want to mature in you. I want to be more like you. I want to honor you greater. And then outward growth. The Great Commission, Matthew 28, what does he say? Go make disciples. That's seeking the kingdom, right? Go make disciples. 
Because the growing population is the king's glory. The more people that are worshiping and serving and loving the Lord Jesus, the more glory he receives. That's what, that's what seeking the kingdom is. Are you going after this thing? I don't know. Above all else means position. That means uh, position and priority. That means it's the, the first thing that I do. It's the best thing that I do. It's the thing that I do most uh, for the Christ follower with authentic faith. The majority of their resources would be funneling into this endeavor. Undeniable. Time-wise. Are, are you attending weekly worship every single week? Is, is that like, or are you just neglecting it as some people do? He said, seek the kingdom of God above all things. Are you, are you here to learn and grow and worship? Are you here to, to bless others and encourage them and inviting them here? I, I don't know. Are you consistent? Are you, are you in consistent, large time blocks of prayer? Are you in consistent time blocks of studying God's word alone and together? We're talking about time here. Are you spending that time pursuing the kingdom of God in you so you can pursue it out there? And are you verbally sharing the gospel with the unsaved? Seek my kingdom above all else and I'll take care of you. Who would you rather have taken care of your needs? Almighty God or you? I can't even balance a checkbook. I, I, I don't know my multiplication tables. When I handed over the, 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 the books to this church from one lady who was doing it, there was a little gap of a few months where I had to do it. I handed it to Eileen and she, I don't know if she threw up or laughed. I, I can't even add. Oh, you're supposed to save those receipts? I don't know. And, and I should be in charge of my finances, right? No. No, totally clueless. <laughs> when I was making good money, I had a friend in the neighborhood who said, please, just give me your check. And Why are you so broke? Just give me your check and I'll give you money. When you need it. I had no idea what I'm doing. So should I be in charge of my finances and provision? <laughs> no. All God's people said, no. Right, no. How about money? How about seeking first the kingdom of God? Like, like um, what happens when the offering plate comes around? What, what happens? Uh, are, we, are, we, are we supporting missionaries? Like, I was so proud of you guys. A couple weeks ago when Manny and Wilmer were here, it was awesome. You guys were so, uh, listen, I can get up here and I can exhort you and, 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 and rebuke and do all these things with God's word, but let me just take this moment to just, to bless you. You guys were so, they raised over $600. They only needed what, three? 300 bucks. They walked out of here with over six. You were generous. It was awesome, right? That was good. You can clap. It's good. You praise God. Praise God, right? He worked on your heart. It was, listen, we can't even take credit for that. Do you see, he wasn't asking you for something, was he? He was trying to give you something. He's trying to bless you. Let go of the bondage that, that money has on you. Release it so he could do his kingdom work. Doesn't that, doesn't that feel good? For those, listen, don't boast or brag. Don't raise your hand because you're not supposed to tell the left from the right from what you give and do. But those that gave, don't you feel good right now that you actually helped some kids that were hungry? Isn't that awesome? He's not trying to take something from you. He's trying to give something to you. Yeah. You know, we sponsor a couple of compassion kids here in the church. And we're struggling financially right now, like real bad. But every month we have three. We have Emmanuel, Holy, and Angel. And every month, 38 bucks a month gets taken out of our account here at the church for each child. So again, I don't know my math, my math, so I can't tell you what that is. It's a lot. 38 times three. Any engineers out there can spout that one off? 114. Awesome. Every month, right? We got to make sure we pay that, guys. We should want to. Let's, let's do more. Let's, let's get another kid. 
Let's sponsor another one, right? Let's do that. Let's sponsor, let's sponsor 10, 20, 30 kids. Let's pack this place and have resources we can sponsor these kids and give them a future and a hope, right? Let's do that. Another resource we have is our effort, right? Serving in the, in the local expression that God placed you in. The Bible says it, that as each of us do our own special work, it helps the others to grow, right? You know, we have a, one of the great signs of a healthy church, and we're not a massive church by any means, but one of the things that, show, that, we, that we have that shows that we are healthy is that we have a lot of kids that come to our church. And there's churches out there that, that are dying to have some kids. They're begging God, please send some kids. Problem is they're just singing a bunch of old hymns, and they got an old school place, and these young families don't want to go. But we have a lot of kids, right? But we have an extreme deficit for teachers. If you believe that God is going to provide for you, then, then maybe you could set aside a little bit of your own schedule to provide for yourself and volunteer to steward our kids well. So they would know Jesus. They, they would know Jesus loves them. So they would be familiar with God's word. And that one day we would see them give their life to Christ and their mom and dad would baptize them. Yeah. Right? So, so like we need, we need teachers. I would, I would be blessed if before we left tonight, two people, I don't know if that's the number or not, but two people would, would go to Meredith and say, put me on the schedule once a month. I'll teach kids. Sacrifice. You know, it's the Bible says, blessed are the feet of those who, who bring good news, right? And the Bible says it's supposed to compel people to come and fill the Father's house. Remember that? Remember that? You know what? Pizza joints have it, right? People sit, sitting outside slinging a sign, right? That just because I can do this doesn't mean I ever did it for a living. But it's easy, right? You know what I'd like to see? Someone doing this every Saturday night at about 5 o'clock. Compelling them to come in. Listen, I want to share, share the good news with people. I want to see their lives transformed. I want to see our, our city transformed by the power of Jesus Christ. I want people to come and hear what we're talking about right now. And so, you know what would be awesome? If someone would come up to me before the night's over and go, You know what, Pastor? Every single Saturday night, every single Saturday night, because Christian people are supposed to be Christian, uh, are supposed to be people of character, right? So when they say it, they, they do it, right? So every Saturday night, pastor, I'm going to sling that sign out there, and I'm going to smile out there, and I'm going to wave, and I'm going to ask people to come in and hear the message of the gospel. So you know, you don't have to tell me. I'm going to leave it right here. And you can come by and you can grab it before you leave. That's your sign now. You want a sign? There it is. There it is. You know what else we need? This is important. I'm just throwing it out there, right? When we, when we come up here, right, we, hear, we see the lyrics up there so we can sing praises to Jesus. Do the lyrics help? Does it help you, right? Right? And, and, and the verses that we put up there so you can reference your Bible. You know what? Debbie's been doing it for us for, for a long while. Since we started Sundays, Debbie's been doing it for us. But as many of you know, you know, she's had some real health issues lately. And she, could, she lost her vision. She was here tonight. I don't know if she's gone or not. But we're, we're thankful that she was here, right? She's getting better. That was awesome. We prayed for her. She's getting better. But she can't do that right now on Sunday. So I need somebody who can do the same thing like this. I need someone to say, Pastor... Every Sunday, I will be here at 9.30, not 9.31. That stresses me out, yo. Okay, 9.30, I'm going to be here because I'm seeking first the kingdom of God. I, I'm seeking the kingdom of God expanding. And so I want to make sure that I'm going to do my part to put those lyrics on that screen and put those Bible verses on that screen so whoever comes in here on Sunday, just like I am here right now, that they're going to have God's word provided for them so they can have the same Savior that I have. Amen. I'd love to see someone go see Jessica before she, he or she leaves tonight and says, you know what, Jessica... I'm a Christian, and I commit every Sunday. I'll be right there at 930. Can you do this? Let me see. Everyone hold up a finger. The first one. And go like this. You can do the computer. That's what you have to do right there. It's all you got to do, right? Time, money, and effort. Listen, God's word is quite clear. That when we actually believe in God through Jesus Christ, his son, something of this belief should result in action. Yeah. 
right? And I'm not making this up. It's all throughout God's word. It says it over and over and over again. Here's a few of them. Acts 26, 20, Paul said, I preached that they should repent and turn to God, right? We know that. We all need to repent. We, we used to live this way. We used to believe this, but I don't believe that anymore. I'm not doing that anymore. I used to be going here. Now I'm going here. I have a new belief system, a new way of thinking, right? He says, I preached that they would repent and turn to God, but he doesn't stop. And demonstrate, isn't that the, that's the seeing again, isn't it? It keeps popping up in scripture. And demonstrate their repentance by their deeds. You see? He doesn't want you to just believe it. He wants you to show it. Matthew 3, 8, John the Baptist, prior to Jesus going to the cross, prior for the sacrifice that would forgive our sins for all humanity, if you want it, for all time, John the Baptist said in Matthew 3, 8, in the NIV, it says to produce fruit in keeping with repentance. The New Living Translation that we use kind of really illustrates it well. It says, prove, they're seeing again, prove by the way you live that you have repented of your sins and turned to God. See, I'm believing something different. And I want to show that I actually believe what I say. You know, I have to be careful personally of this. And I, I have been gifted by God. It's not my own doing, but I've been gifted to, to teach and exhort people that you must put God first. That's what I do. And I, every week I might be talking about something different, but I keep saying the same thing over and over again. That's, that's my gifting. But I have to be very, very careful because in my zeal, I can slip into sincerity instead of faith. What I mean by that is that God says, listen, I want you to tell everyone about me. Put, tell them to put me first. Put me first. I'm, you're my mouthpiece. Put me first. And in my zeal to do that, I forget that he makes a promise in Matthew 16, 18 that he's going to build his church. So what happens if I close my mouth for the rest of eternity? Would he build his church? Yes. Say yes. yes. Oh, yes. oh yes. He don't need me. I'm nothing, but he's called me to do it, so I, I'm supposed to, but, 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 but I, I, I forget, and so this whole thing about like Sabbath, like I, I have zeal, I want to tell you to turn to God and make him first in your life and serve him and love him and, and, and worship him and tell everyone about him and awesome, but, but in my zeal to do that, that doesn't mean I'm supposed to do it nonstop, every day, all day long, there's a thing called the Sabbath, you're supposed to rest, and so sometimes I slip into neglect of that and, and somehow I need to tell everyone because God won't build his church without Moses. So not real and so not right. And listen, we are all busy. And so I have a major job to do. I know that. But I don't need to do it 24 hours a day, seven days a week. That sends a message to God that I don't have faith in your statement that you will build your church. I need to be obedient just like I'm asking you to be. We are all busy, too busy to pray, too busy uh, buying stuff and spending to give, too busy to serve and attend. So true. You know, Monday Night Football is, is in gear now. And that could be the death of Monday Night Prayer. It could be. It could be. But I'm challenging all of you, everyone, you know, some players have a pregame routine. You know, every single game that Bill Russell would play, Red Auerbach would make him go and puke. That's what he did. That was his pregame routine. And when Bill Russell didn't puke, Red Auerbach knew they had a problem. And he'd make him go puke. I'm just going to ask you, make your, if you like Monday Night Football, awesome. Go root for your stupid team. That means nothing. But, but, but listen, Make your pre-game routine to come to prayer. Listen, you can even pray for your favorite stupid team. He's not listening to you on that one. Because the guy who you're playing against is praying the same stupid prayer for his team. But you can come and do that all you want. But when you're done doing that stupid stuff, pray about something important. So make that your pre-game routine to go and, and pray. I'm challenging all of us and all of you watching, come on Monday night from 7 to 8 and pray. And, and you know, well, listen, we're not, our big thing is on Saturday. It's not Sunday, right? So, so NFL doesn't impact. Yeah, but you know what's bigger than NFL now? College football. College football. 
And, and college football stands in, in opposition to us on Saturday night. Do you, know, do you know that no matter who wins that game, you're going to get nothing. You will never get a dime. You will never get a, a, a ring. You will never get a, 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 you'll get nothing if they win or lose. And we're crazy about our teams. And we, do you know, I, listen, I've been doing this for a long time. You know how many people I know and love and they say they believe in Jesus? Come Saturday night, their game is on. If it's a night game, you will not see them in church. <clears throat> None of these football games impact you in any way. So if provision is promised by seeking God above all else as your first thing, your best thing, your most thing, if that's what we really believe, then is it far-fetched to say to your family members and your friends and your employers and speak to your stupid sports addictions, listen, I can't do that or I can't watch that with you right now because I'm going to church. Is, is it far-fetched to say these things? Is it far-fetched to say, I can't go to work on fill-in-the-blank because um, I'm serving on the worship band at Revolution Church, and we have practiced on Thursday night at 7, so no Mr. Employer, no Mr. Customer, I'm not doing that because I have an obligation, a joyful one to the Lord, and he promised if I put him first, he'd provide for my needs, so I'm leaving now. Amen. Is it far-fetched to believe that we should say that? I don't think so. Is it far-fetched to say, I can't purchase this thing right now that I so desperately want, it looks so good, and, and they're doing a special on it, and, and, and there's only seven left. I can't buy it because I'm going to sow that cash into my church to reach the world. I'm going to do that instead. Is it too far-fetched to say that? Is it too far-fetched to say, I won't be going to fill in the blank with you, Mom. I knew you just flew in town, and I love you very much, and I know you, 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 you had labor for 27 hours, and you were pregnant for 15 months, and you breastfed me for 17 years, but, but on Thursday, I can't go with you because I study at the mall God's word with my faith family. Is that too far-fetched to say that? Is it far-fetched to say, you know what? I didn't just memorize the verses on forgiveness from Ephesians and Colossians. No, I actually forgave such and such a person for such and such of an offense. Authentic Christianity combines belief with faith. And here's the last one. Forgiveness, provision, and my future. My future. You know, Irma just went through, right? And, and so all of us made our plans. Some of us left, some of us didn't. Some of us uh, got a generator, some of us didn't. Some of us boarded up and some of us didn't. We all did different things, right? Well, we made a decision of what we were going to do. We we're going to stay in our house. We bought no water. We bought no food. We filled up our gas tanks. That was it. That's what we did to prepare for this storm. And my, my father, he calls me up. We have no relationship, really. He calls me up, and he asked me what we're going to do for this storm. And I told him what I just told you. Nothing. And I told him, I said, look, I, we believe in God. God's going to protect us and provide for us. We're good. He goes, well, won't you at least consider the well-being of your children? Oh, if I could have reached through that phone right then and there. You don't think I think about them? He goes, well, you're, just gonna, you're not just going to live on, on your faith, are you? Oh, then I really want to reach through that phone. Yeah, I am. Yeah, I am. What else, what else am I going to rely on? The Army Corps of Engineers who built the wall in, in, in New Orleans? They got flooded 
Oh, no wall's going no water's gonna get by this one. Our best wisdom. Flood. How about the king of Jericho? He believed in his army. He believed in his wall, all the best that man could do. God had something to say about that. Ah! They screamed, it came down. You're dang right I'm going to believe in my Jesus. What else would I believe in? What would be better than that? I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord. We know that one. You might not know this one, though. Job 14, 5. You have decided the length of our lives. You know how many months we will live, and we are not going to have, I'm sorry, we are not given a minute longer. Like that, that's kind of frightening, but also like relieving, right? He already knows. Can't do nothing about it. Nothing, you, no wall you can build can defend. No army you can, you can round up is going to stop. No, it doesn't matter how many push-ups and sit-ups and how much carrots, how, many, how much juicing you do and, and vegan and all these things. Listen, God knows how long you're going to live and you're not going to get a minute more than that. How about Psalm 139? You, you saw me before I was born. Every day of my life was, that's past tense, recorded in your book. Every moment was laid out before a single day had passed. Listen, you, you created me. You knew me. You love me. You'll never forsake me. Jesus said, I'm with you. So why are Christians, like why, why do Christian couples avoid marriage? We're not ready. How many people were ever married, ready for marriage? You're not ready for me. I don't care if you think you're married or not. If you don't, God's given us his word on how to do a successful marriage. It's right here. It's right here, right? So it doesn't matter if you're, the only way you're ready to be a, a, a successful marriage is right here. You do this or you're going to fail. Living proof. Anyone else? Living proof. Why, why are Christian couples like so afraid to have married couples? We can't have kids because we're not ready. We got to get ready. Again, who's ever been ready to have kids? Still not. I've got six. I didn't want any. But one day my wife, my beautiful wife, came home from a Bible study reading this Nancy Lay DeMoss book. She's from hell, I'm telling you right now. <laughs> Just kidding. And she came home and she said, well, God's the author of life. And if God's the one who creates life, what are we trying to protect that from? So let's just be a Christian couple and, and, and don't preach faith. Let's live by it. Let's just be husband and wife and love each other. And if he wants to make babies, he'll make babies. Jameson and Jackson, I'm almost 50. You think it's funny, don't you? We'll send them right to your house tonight. Don't think I, I know I have a connection card for all of you. I'll send them to your house. I know where you live. I'm not sending them to Tyler's house, I can tell you that. Why are people so afraid of the end? Stockpiling their, their food and, and, and their, their, their crops and their chickens and, and everyone's stockpiling guns and bullets and they're, they're stock, getting ready for the, the zombie apocalypse, right? Woo! Really? You think your guns are going to stop something? If zombies are coming, what do you think your little pea shooter is going to do? How much food can you save up for the end of the world? Really? You could fill this whole room up with food. You know, eventually it's going to run out, right? And people from the Mad Max movie are going to come in here and take your stinking food anyway. <laughs> so what are you doing? Uh, you know what you're doing? I don't trust you, God. Seek my kingdom above all else, right? I already know what you need. I already know when the end is coming. I know the day I'm sending Jesus down there to rip open the clouds. I know that day, but my, my promise to provide is not waived. I'm going to take care of you. 
Trust in the Lord with all your heart, Proverbs 3, 5 says. Lean not on your own understanding and seek God's will in all you do and he will direct you. Isaiah 30, verse 21, whether you turn to the right or to the left, your ears will hear a voice behind you saying, this is the way, walk in it. See, if I know the plans for you and I will never leave you and I promise to tell you what to do, can't you trust me? Can't you trust me? Is Romans 8, 28 just this awesome verse for you to memorize and put it on your t-shirt that all things work out for the good to those who love the Lord and are called to his purpose? Is it a verse to memorize or is it a truth you believe so deeply down in your soul that you live in accordance to God's word because you know that any other result is second best at best. I want the band to come up, please. We're gonna, we're gonna sing to Jesus. Are you guys ready to sing to Jesus? I'm so ready to sing to Jesus. As they come up here and, and, and start playing, I just want to tell you this. Here's my heart's desire for our church. And I believe it's God's desire as well. I want our church to be full. I want our church to be full of weirdos. I do. I want it to be full of weirdos. You know why they're weird? They're weird only because they actually like the way the scriptures prescribe that we should live our life. That, that they actually live a life that, that the word of God and what they believe that's in here actually permeates their will. And they live according to it. Where, where, where our church family could say, I believe who God is. I believe what God says. I believe what God promises. I believe I can trust him. And this belief is so real that it dictates how I live my life moment by moment. That it's not just something that I say, but it's something that I and we live. Amen? Amen. Father, I, uh, I thank you for your word. I think I went very long tonight, Lord, but I thank you for your grace. I thank you for the grace of the congregation, uh, willing to listen uh, hopefully now, Lord, willing to submit to the word that's been spoken. Uh, Lord, I pray that you would uh, give us faith to believe that what we hear is real and true, that we can count on you, that we can trust you, Lord, that the things of this world are, are fleeting, but the things of God are real and forever that nobody knows us more than you do, that nobody loves us more than you do, and that your promises to us are from a heart of love, and that you don't lie, and you don't change. And so therefore, we could trust you with your promises. So Lord, help us to, to, to take what we heard, to take it from believing it and moving it to faith. Help us to take what we believe and live it out. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen.